The alchemist picked up a book that someone in the caravan had brought. Leafing through the pages, he found a story about Narcissus. The alchemist knew the legend of Narcissus, a youth who knelt daily beside a lake to contemplate his own beauty. He was so fascinated by himself that one morning he fell into the lake and drowned. At the spot where he fell, a flower was born, which was called the Narcissus. But this was not how the author of the book ended the story. He said that when Narcissus died, the goddesses of the forest appeared and found the lake, which had been fresh water, transformed into a lake of salty tears. Why do you weep? the goddesses asked. I weep for Narcissus, the lake replied. Ah, it is no surprise that you weep for Narcissus, they said, for though we always pursued him in the forest, you alone could contemplate his beauty close at hand. But was Narcissus beautiful? the lake asked. Who better than you to know that, the goddesses said in wonder. After all, it was by your banks that he knelt each day to contemplate himself. The lake was silent for some time. Finally it said, I weep for Narcissus, but I never noticed that Narcissus was beautiful. I weep because each time he knelt beside my banks, I could see in the depths of his eyes my own beauty reflected. What a lovely story, the alchemist thought. The boy's name was Santiago. Dusk was falling as the boy arrived with his herd at an abandoned church. The roof had fallen in long ago, and an enormous sycamore had grown on the spot where the sacristy had once stood. He decided to spend the night there. He swept the floor with his jacket and lay down, using the book he had just finished reading as a pillow. He told himself that he'd have to start reading thicker books. They lasted longer and made more comfortable pillows. Looking up, he could see the stars through the half-destroyed roof. He had had the same dream that night as a week ago, and once again he had awakened before it ended. I wanted to sleep a little longer, he thought.
he arose and, taking up his crook, began to awaken the sheep that still slept. He'd noticed that as soon as he awoke, most of his animals also began to stir. It was as if some mysterious energy bound his life to that of the sheep, with whom he had spent the past two years, leading them through the countryside in search of food and water. shepherd urged his sheep in the direction of the sun. They never have to make any decisions, he thought. Maybe that's why they always stay close to me. If I became a monster today and decided to kill them one by one, they would become aware only after most of the flock had been slaughtered, thought the boy. They trust me, and they've forgotten how to rely on their own instincts because I lead them to nourishment. The boy was surprised at his thoughts. Maybe the church, with the sycamore growing from within, had been haunted. It had caused him to have the same dream for a second time, and it was causing him to feel anger towards his faithful companions. He drank a bit from the wine that remained from his dinner of the night before, and he gathered his jacket closer to his body. The jacket had a purpose, and so did the boy. His purpose in life was to travel, and after two years of walking the Andalusian terrain, he knew all the cities of the region. He had studied Latin, Spanish, and theology. But ever since he had been a child, he had wanted to know the world. And this was much more important to him than knowing God and learning about man's sins. One afternoon, on a visit to his family, he had summoned up the courage to tell his father that he didn't want to become a priest, that he wanted to travel. People from all over the world have passed through this village, son, said his father. They come in search of new things, but when they leave, they're basically the same people they were when they arrived. They climb the mountain to see the castle, and they wind up thinking that the past was better than what we have now. They have blonde hair or dark skin, but basically they're the same as the people who live right here. Amongst us, the only ones who travel are the shepherds. Well then, I'll be a shepherd. His father said no more. The next day, he gave his son a pouch that held three ancient Spanish gold coins. He gave the boy his blessing. The boy could see in his father's gaze a desire to be able himself to travel the world. A desire that was still alive, despite his father's having had to bury it over dozens of years under the burden of struggling for water to drink, food to eat, and the same place to sleep every night of his life. The horizon was tinged with red, and suddenly the sun appeared. The boy thought back to that conversation with his father and felt happy. The world was huge and inexhaustible. He had only to allow his sheep to set the route for a while, and he would discover other interesting things. The problem is that they don't even realize that they're walking a new road every day. They don't see that the fields are new and the seasons change. Looking at the sun, he calculated that he would reach Tarifa before midday. It's the possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting, he thought. 
as he looked again at the position of the sun and hurried his pace, he had suddenly remembered that in Tarifa there was an old woman who interpreted dreams. The old woman led the boy to a room at the back of her house. The woman sat down and told him to be seated as well. I see the future coming. It speaks of drama. Here is a realizing shadow of your dream. Here is the sacrifice of your Treasure of your soul, life. All those are deep inside the treasure of your heart. Coming from here inside the messages to try to bring to you. So don't you ever realize until you get better by for this, better by treating, better by knowing how it is. Never to witness, multiply. I'm not going to charge you anything now, she said, but I want one tenth of the treasure if you find it. The boy laughed out of happiness. He was going to be able to save the little money he had because of a dream about hidden treasure. It's a dream in the language of the world, she said. I can interpret it, but the interpretation is very difficult, and this is my interpretation. You must go to the pyramids in Egypt. I have never heard of them, but if it was a child who showed them to you, they exist. There you will find a treasure that will make you a rich man. The boy was surprised and then irritated. He didn't need to seek out the old woman for this. But then he remembered that he wasn't going to have to pay anything. I didn't need to waste my time just for this, he said. I told you that your dream was a difficult one. It's the simple things in life that are the most extraordinary. Only wise men are able to understand them. And since I am not wise, I have had to learn other arts, such as the reading of palms. Well, how am I going to get to Egypt? I only interpret dreams. I don't know how to turn them into reality. And what if I never get to Egypt? Then I don't get paid. It wouldn't be the first time. And the woman told the boy to leave, saying she'd already wasted too much time with him. So the boy was disappointed. He decided he would never again believe in dreams. He remembered that he had a number of things he had to take care of. He went to the market for something to eat. He traded his book for one that was thicker, and he found a bench in the plaza where he could sample the new wine he had bought.
As he read on, an old man sat down at his side and tried to strike up a conversation. What are they doing? the old man asked, pointing at the people in the plaza. Working, the boy answered dryly. The old man persisted in his attempt to strike up a conversation. Hmm, this is an important book, but it's really irritating. It's a book that says the same thing almost all the other books in the world say. It describes people's inability to choose their own personal legends. And it ends up saying that everyone believes the world's greatest lie. Well, what's the world's greatest lie, the boy asked, completely surprised. It's this, that at a certain point in our lives, we lose control of what's happening to us, and our lives become controlled by fate. That's the world's greatest lie. Where are you from? the boy asked. From many places. No one can be from many places, the boy said. Well then, we could say that I was born in Salem. Salem was, but he didn't want to ask, fearing that he would appear ignorant. And, um, what do you do in Salem, he insisted. What do I do in Salem, the old man laughed. Well, I'm the king of Salem. My name is Melchizedek. How many sheep do you have? Enough, said the boy. Well then, we've got a problem. I can't help you if you feel you've got enough sheep. Give me one-tenth of your sheep, said the old man, and I'll tell you how to find the hidden treasure. Something bright reflected from his chest with such intensity that the boy was momentarily blinded. With a movement that was too quick for someone of his age, the man covered what it was with his cape. When his vision returned to normal, the boy was able to read what the old man had written in the sand. There, in the sand of the plaza of that small city, the boy read the names of his father and his mother, and he read things he had never told anyone. Why would a king be talking with a shepherd, the boy asked? For several reasons, but let's say the most important is that you have succeeded in discovering your personal legend. It's what you have always wanted to accomplish. Everyone, when they are young, knows what their personal legend is. At that point in their lives, everything is clear and everything is possible. 
They are not afraid to dream and to yearn for everything they would like to see happen to them in their lives. But as time passes, a mysterious force begins to convince them that it will be impossible for them to realize their personal legend. The soul of the world is nourished by people's happiness and also by unhappiness, envy and jealousy. The wind began to pick up. He knew that wind. People called it the Levanta because on it the Moors had come from the Levant at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Levanta increased in intensity. Here I am between my flock and my treasure, the boy thought. In order to find the treasure, you will have to follow the omens. Take these said the old man, holding out a white stone and a black stone that had been embedded at the center of the breastplate. They are called Urim and Thummim. The black signifies yes, the white no. When you are unable to read the omens, they will help you to do so. Always ask an objective question. But if you can, try to make your own decisions. The treasure is at the pyramids, that you already know. But I had to insist on the payment of six sheep because I helped you make the decision. The boy put the stones in his pouch. From then on, he would make his own decisions.
How strange Africa is, thought the boy. He was sitting in a bar, very much like the other bars he had seen along the narrow streets of Tangier. Some men were smoking from a gigantic pipe that they passed from one to the other. In just a few hours he had seen men walking hand in hand, women with their faces covered, and priests that climbed to the tops of towers and chanted, and everyone about him went to their knees and placed their foreheads on the ground. The boy felt ill and terribly alone. Only Arabic was spoken in this country. But he didn't need to worry about that right now. What he had to be concerned about was his treasure, and the boy knew that in money there was magic. Whoever has money is never really alone. Before long, maybe in just a few days, he would be at the pyramids. Are you? He heard a voice ask him in Spanish. The boy was relieved. He was thinking about omens, and someone had appeared. How come you speak Spanish? He asked. The new arrival was a young man in Western dress, but the color of his skin suggested he was from this city. He was about the same age and height as the boy. Almost everyone here speaks Spanish. We're only two hours from Spain. Sit down. Let me treat you to something," said the boy. The boy told him that he needed to get to the pyramids. He almost began to tell about his treasure, but decided not to do so. If he did. It was possible that the Arab would want a part of it as payment for taking him there. He remembered what the old man had said about offering something you didn't even have yet. I'd like you to take me there if you can. I can pay you to serve as my guide. Do you have any idea how to get there? The newcomer asked. The boy noticed that the owner of the bar stood nearby, listening attentively to their conversation. He felt uneasy at the man's presence, but he had found a guide. And didn't want to miss out on an opportunity. You have to cross the entire Sahara Desert," said the young man. "And to do that, you need money. I need to know whether you have enough." The boy thought it was a strange question. 
He took his money from his pouch and showed it to the young man. The owner of the bar came over and looked as well. The two men exchanged some words in Arabic, and the bar owner seemed irritated. Let's get out of here, said the new arrival. He wants us to leave. The boy was relieved. He got up to pay the bill, but the owner grabbed him and began to speak to him in an angry stream of words. The boy was strong and wanted to retaliate, but he was in a foreign country. His new friend pushed the owner aside and pulled the boy outside with him. He wanted your money, he said. Tangier is not like the rest of Africa. This is a port, and every port has its thieves. The boy took out his money and counted it. We could get to the pyramids by tomorrow, said the other, taking the money. But I have to buy two camels. They walked together through the narrow streets of Tangier. Everywhere there were stalls with items for sale. They reached the center of a large plaza where the market was held. There were thousands of people there, arguing, selling, and buying. But the boy never took his eye off his new friend. After all, he had all his money. I'll just watch him. He said to himself. Suddenly, there in the midst of all that confusion, he saw the most beautiful sword he had ever seen. Ask the owner of that stall how much the sword costs, he said to his friend. Then he realized that he'd been distracted for a few moments looking at the sword. His heart squeezed as if his chest had suddenly compressed it. He was afraid to look around because he knew what he would find.
him was the market, with people coming and going, shouting and buying, and the aroma of strange foods, but nowhere could he find his new company. Then, like a colony of worker ants, they dismantled their stalls and left. My the sun began its departure as well. All this had happened between sunrise and sunset before he So ashamed, where can I be mad? He'd never even wept in front of his own sheep. I wish I was empty. I where I was going to, going many days ago. I have nothing. I have nothing at all. Nothing to test my fortune to. distrustful of people because one person betrayed me. I'm going to hate those who have found their treasure because I never found mine. And I'm going to hold on to what little I have because I'm too insignificant to conquer the world.
put the stones back in the pouch and decided to do an experiment. The old man had said to ask very clear questions, and to do that, the boy had to know what he wanted. So he asked if the old man's blessing was still with him. He took out one of the stones. It was yes. Learn to recognize omens and follow them, the old king had said. An omen? The boy smiled to himself. I promised that I would make my own decisions, he said to himself. He looked around at the empty plaza again, feeling less desperate than before. This wasn't a strange place. It was a new one. After all, what he had always wanted was just that, to know new places. Even if he never got to the pyramids, he'd already travelled farther than any shepherd he knew. Oh, if only they knew how different things are, just two hours by ship from where they are, he thought. I'm an adventurer, looking for treasure, he said to himself. Relaxed and unhurried, he resolved that he would walk through the narrow streets of Tangier. Only in that way would he be able to read the omens. There must be a language that doesn't depend on words, the boy thought. I've already had that experience with my sheep, and now it's happening with people. He realized, if I can learn to understand this language without words, I can learn to understand the world. All things are one, the old man had said. The crystal merchant awoke with the day and felt the same anxiety that he felt every morning. He had been in the same place for thirty years, a shop at the top of a hilly street where few customers passed. Now it was too late to change anything. The only thing he had ever learned to do was to buy and sell crystal glassware. There had been a time when many people knew of his shop, Arab merchants, French and English geologists, German soldiers who were always well healed. In those days, it had been wonderful to be selling crystal, and he had thought how he would become rich and have beautiful women at his side as he grew older. But as time passed, Tangier had changed. The nearby city of Ceuta had grown faster than Tangier, and business had fallen off. Neighbors moved away, and there remained only a few small shops on the hill. And no one was going to climb the hill just to browse through a few small shops. But the crystal merchant had no choice. He had lived 30 years of his life buying and selling crystal pieces, and now it was too late to do anything else. He spent the entire morning observing the infrequent comings and goings in the street. He had done this for years and knew the schedule of everyone who passed. But just before lunchtime, a boy stopped in front of the shop. He was dressed normally, but the practiced eye of the crystal merchant could see that the boy had no money to spend. A card hanging in the doorway announced that several languages were spoken in the shop. The boy saw a man appear behind the counter. I can clean up those glasses in the window if you want, said the boy. The way they look now, no one's going to want to buy them. The man looked at him without responding. In exchange, 
you could give me something to eat. The man still said nothing, and the boy sensed that he was going to have to make a decision. Taking the jacket out, he began to clean the glasses. In half an hour, he had cleaned all the glasses in the window, and as he was doing so, two customers had entered the shop and bought some crystal. The merchant turned to the boy and said, "I'd like you to work in my shop. Two customers came in today while you were working, and that's a good omen." "Do you want to go to work for me?" the merchant asked. "I can work for the rest of today," the boy answered. "I'll work all night until dawn, and I'll clean every piece of crystal in your shop." In return, I need money to get to Egypt tomorrow. The merchant laughed. Even if you clean my crystal for an entire year, even if you earned a good commission selling every piece, you would still have to borrow money to get to Egypt. There are thousands of kilometers of desert between here and there. There was a moment of silence, so profound that it seemed the city was asleep. No sound from the bazaars, no arguments among the merchants, no men climbing to the towers to chant, no hope, no adventure, no old kings or personal legends, no treasure, and no pyramids. It was as if the world had fallen silent because the boy's soul had. He sat there, staring blankly through the door of the cafe, wishing that he had died. And that everything would end forever at that moment. The merchant looked anxiously at the boy. All the joy he had seen that morning had suddenly disappeared. I can give you the money you need to get back to your country, my son," said the crystal merchant. The boy said nothing. He got up, adjusted his clothing, and picked up his pouch. "I'll work for you," he said. And after another long silence, he added. I need money to buy some sheep. Said that. 
Boy had been working for the crystal merchant for almost a month. I'd like to build a display case for the crystal, the boy said to the merchant. We could place it outside and attract those people who pass at the bottom of the hill. Business has really improved, he said to the boy after the customer had left. I'm doing much better, and soon you'll be able to return to your sheep. Why ask more out of life? Because we have to respond to omens, the boy said. Why did you want to get to the pyramids? He asked to get away from the business of the display. Because I've always heard about them, the boy answered, saying nothing about his dream. The merchant was silent for a few moments. Then he said, well, "The prophet gave us the Quran and left us just five obligations to satisfy during our lives. The most important is to believe only in the one true God. The others are to pray five times a day, fast during Ramadan." And be charitable to the poor. What's the fifth obligation? The boy asked. You said that I had never dreamed of travel. The merchant answered. The fifth obligation of every Muslim is a pilgrimage. We are obliged at least once in our lives to visit the holy city of Mecca. Mecca is a lot further away than the pyramids. When I was young, all I wanted to do was to put together enough money to start this shop. I thought that some day I'd be rich and could go to Mecca. I began to make some money, but I could never bring myself to leave someone in charge of the shop. The crystals are delicate things. At the same time, people were passing my shop all the time, heading for Mecca. Well, why don't you go to Mecca now? Asked the boy. Because it's the thought of Mecca that keeps me alive. That's what helps me face these days that are all the same. These mute crystals on the shelves and. Lunch and dinner at that same horrible cafe. I'm afraid that if my dream is realised, I'll have no reason to go on living. You dream about your sheep and the pyramids, but you're different from me because you want to realise your dreams. I just want to dream about Mecca. I've already imagined a thousand times crossing the desert, arriving at the Plaza of the Sacred Stone, the seven times I walk around it before allowing myself to touch it. I've already imagined the people who would be at my side, and those in front of me, and the conversations and prayers we would share. But I'm afraid that it would all be a disappointment. So I prefer just to dream about it. Two more months passed. And the shelf brought many customers into the crystal shop. Since that morning in the marketplace, he had never again made use of Urim and Thummim, because Egypt was now just as distant a dream for him as was Mecca for the merchant. One afternoon, he'd seen a man at the top of the hill complaining that it was impossible to find a decent place to get something to drink after such a climb. The boy, accustomed to recognizing omens, spoke to the merchant. Let's sell tea to the people who climb the hill. No,、oh, lots of places sell tea around here. The merchant said, but we could sell tea in crystal glasses. The people will enjoy the tea and want to buy the glasses. I've been told that beauty is the great seducer of men. The merchant didn't respond. That afternoon, after saying his prayers and closing the shop, he invited the boy to sit with him and share his hookah, that strange pipe used by the Arabs. Maktou, the merchant said finally. What does that mean? You would have had to have been born an Arab to understand, he answered. But in your language, it would be something like, "It is written." And as he smothered the coals in the hookah, he told the boy that he could begin to sell tea in the crystal glasses. Sometimes there's just no way to hold back the river.
The boy awoke before dawn. It had been eleven months and nine days since he had first set foot on the African continent. He dressed in his Arabian clothing of white linen, bought especially for this day. He put his headcloth in place and secured it with a ring made of camel skin. Wearing his new sandals, he descended the stairs silently. The city was still sleeping. He prepared himself a sandwich and drank some hot tea from a crystal glass. Then he sat in the sun-filled doorway, smoking the hooker. He smoked in silence, thinking of nothing, and listening to the sound of the wind that brought the scent of the desert. When he had finished his smoke, he reached into one of his pockets and sat there for a few moments regarding what he had withdrawn. It was a bundle of money. He waited patiently for the merchant to awaken and open the shop. Then the two went off to have some more tea. I'm leaving today, said the boy. I have the money I need to buy my sheep, and you have the money you need to go to Mecca. The old man said nothing. Will you give me your blessing, asked the boy. You have helped me. The man continued to prepare his tea, saying nothing. Then he turned to the boy. I'm proud of you, he said. You brought a new feeling into my crystal shop. But you know that I'm not going to Mecca. Just as you know that you are not going to buy your sheep. Who told you that? asked the boy, startled. Maktoub, said the old crystal merchant. And he gave the boy his blessing. The boy went to his room and packed his belongings. They filled three sacks. As he was leaving, he saw in the corner of the room his old shepherd's pouch. It was bunched up, and he'd hardly thought of it for a long time. As he took his jacket out of the pouch, thinking to give it to someone in the street, the two stones fell to the floor. Urim and Thumim. Never stop dreaming, the old king had said. Follow the omens. The boy picked up Urim and Thumim and once again had the strange sensation that the old king was nearby. He had worked hard for a year and the omens were that it was time to go. I'm going to go back to doing just what I did before, the boy thought even though the sheep didn't teach me to speak Arabic. But the sheep had taught him something even more important, that there was a language in the world that everyone understood, a language the boy had used throughout the time that he was trying to improve things at the shop. It was the language of enthusiasm, of things accomplished with love and purpose, and as part of a search for something believed in and desired. When you want something, all the universe conspires to help you achieve it, the old king had said. From where he stood, he saw for the first time that the old merchant's hair was very much like the hair of the old king. It's almost as if he had been here and left his mark, he thought. I can always go back to being a shepherd, the boy thought. I learned how to care for sheep and I haven't forgotten how that's done. But maybe I'll never have another chance to get to the pyramids in Egypt. The old man wore a breastplate of gold and he knew about my past. He really was a king, a wise king.
he was once again on the way to his treasure. I am always nearby when someone wants to realize their personal legends. The Englishman was sitting on a bench in a structure that smelled of animals, sweat and dust. It was part warehouse, part corral. I never thought I'd end up in a place like this, he thought, as he leafed through the pages of a chemical journal. Ten years at the university and here I am in a corral. But he had to move on. He believed in omens. All his life and all his studies were aimed at finding the one true language of the universe. First. He had studied Esperanto, then the world's religions, and now it was alchemy. He knew how to speak Esperanto. He understood all the major religions well, but he wasn't yet an alchemist. He had unraveled the truths behind important questions, but his studies had taken him to a point beyond which he couldn't seem to go. He had tried in vain to establish a relationship with an alchemist, but the alchemists were strange people who thought only about themselves and almost always refused to help him. Who knows, maybe they had failed to discover the secret of the masterwork, the Philosopher's Stone, and for this reason kept their knowledge to themselves. He had already spent much of the fortune left him by his father, fruitlessly seeking the Philosopher's Stone. He'd spent enormous amounts of time at the great libraries of the world and had purchased all the rarest and most important volumes on alchemy. In one, he had read that many years ago, a famous Arabian alchemist had visited Europe. It was said that he was more than 200 years old and that he had discovered the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. He lives in the al Faum oasis. The Englishman cancelled all his commitments and pulled together the most important of his books. And now, here he was, sitting inside a dusty, smelly warehouse. Outside, a huge caravan was being prepared for a crossing of the Sahara and was scheduled to pass through al Faum. A young Arab, also loaded down with baggage, entered and greeted the Englishman. Where are you bound? asked the young Arab. I'm going into the desert, the man answered, turning back to his reading. I'm going to find that damned alchemist, the Englishman thought, and the odor of the animals became a bit more tolerable. Thank you. 
That's strange, said the boy, as he tried once again to read the burial scene that began the book. I've been trying for two years to read this book, and I never get past these first few pages. When I decided to seek out my treasure, I never imagined that I'd wind up working in a crystal shop, he thought. And joining this caravan may have been my decision, but where it goes is going to be a mystery to me. Nearby was the Englishman, reading a book. He seemed unfriendly, and had looked irritated when the boy had entered. They might even have become friends, but the Englishman closed off the conversation. The boy closed his book. He felt he didn't want to do anything that might make him look like the Englishman. He took Urim and Thumim from his pocket and began playing with them. The stranger shouted, Urim and Thumim! <laughs> worth much, the Englishman answered. They're only made of rock crystal, and there are millions of rock crystals in the earth. But those who know about such things would know that those are a rim and thumim. They were given to me as a present by a king, the boy said. The stranger didn't answer. Instead, he put his hand in his pocket, took out two stones that were the same as the boy's. The boy was suddenly happy to be there at the warehouse. Maybe this is an omen, said the Englishman half aloud. Who told you about omens? The boy's interest was increasing by the moment. Everything in life is an omen, said the Englishman, now closing the journal he was reading. language understood by everybody but already forgotten. I'm in search of that universal language amongst other things. That's why I'm here. I have to find a man who knows that universal language, an alchemist. The conversation was interrupted by the warehouse boss. You're in luck, you too, the fat Arab said. There's a caravan leaving today for Al-Fayoum. But I'm going to Egypt, the boy said. Al-Fayoum is in Egypt, said the Arab. What kind of Arab are you? That's a good luck omen, the Englishman said after the fat Arab had gone out. If I could, I'd write a huge encyclopedia just about the words luck and coincidence. It's with those words that the universal language is written. He told the boy it was no coincidence that he had met him with Urim and Thumim in his hand, and he asked the boy if he too were in search of the alchemist. I'm looking for a treasure, said the boy, 
and he immediately regretted having said it, but the Englishman appeared not to attach any importance to it. In a way, so am I, he said. I don't even know what alchemy is, the boy was saying, when the warehouse boss called to them to come outside. I'm the leader of the caravan, said the dark-eyed, bearded man. I hold the power of life and death for every person I take with me. The desert is a capricious lady, and sometimes she drives men crazy. There were almost two hundred people gathered there, and four hundred animals, camels, horses, mules, and fowl. There are a lot of different people here, and each has his own god. But the only god I serve is Allah, and in his name I swear that I will do everything possible once again to win out over the desert. But I want each and every one of you to swear by the god you believe in that you will follow my orders no matter what. In the desert, disobedience means death. A long note was sounded on a bugle, and everyone mounted up. The boy and the Englishman had bought camels and climbed uncertainly onto their backs. The boy felt sorry for the Englishman's camel, loaded down as he was with the cases of books. There's no such thing as coincidence, said the Englishman, picking up the conversation where it had been interrupted in the warehouse. But the caravan began to move, and it was impossible to hear what the Englishman was saying. The boy knew what he was about to describe, though. The mysterious chain that links one thing to another. The closer one gets to realizing his personal legend, the more that personal legend becomes his true reason for being, thought the boy. The desert was all sand in some stretches and rocky in others. One night, a camel driver came to the fire where the Englishman and the boy were sitting. There are rumours of tribal wars, he told them. The three fell silent. The boy noted that there was a sense of fear in the air. They stood there looking at the moon. That's the magic of omens, said the boy. I've seen how the guides read the signs of the desert and how the soul of the caravan speaks to the soul of the desert. The Englishman said, I'd better pay more attention to the caravan. And I'd better read your books, said the boy. They were strange books. They spoke about mercury, salt, dragons and kings, and he didn't understand any of it. But there was one idea that seemed to repeat itself throughout all the books. All things are the manifestation of one thing only. He read the lives of the various people who had succeeded in doing so. Helvetius, Elias, Fulcanelli, and Geber. They were fascinating stories. Each of them lived out his personal legend to the end. They traveled, spoke with wise men, performed miracles for the incredulous, and owned the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. But when the boy wanted to learn how to achieve the masterwork, he became completely lost. There were just drawings, coded instructions, and obscure texts. The boy awoke as the sun rose. There, in front of him, where the small stars had been the night before, was an endless row of date palms stretching across the entire desert.
times rush past and so do the caravans, thought the alchemist, as he watched the hundreds of people and animals arriving at the oasis. People were shouting at the new arrivals, dust obscured the desert sun, and the children of the oasis were bursting with excitement at the arrival of the strangers. The alchemists saw the tribal chiefs greet the leader of the caravan and converse with him at length. But none of that mattered to the alchemist. He'd already seen many people come and go, and the desert remained as it was. He'd seen kings and beggars walking the desert sands. The dunes were changed constantly by the wind, yet these were the same sands he had known since he was a child. He always enjoyed seeing the happiness that the travellers experienced when, after weeks of yellow sand and blue sky, they first saw the green of the date palms. He decided to concentrate on more practical matters. He knew that in the caravan there was a man to whom he was to teach some of his secrets. The omens had told him so. He didn't know the man yet, but his practised eye would recognise him when he appeared. He hoped that it would be someone as capable as his previous apprentice. I don't know why these things have to be transmitted by word of mouth, he thought. He had only one explanation for this fact. Things have to be transmitted this way because they were made up from the pure life, and this kind of life cannot be captured in pictures or words because people become fascinated with pictures and words and wind up forgetting the language of the world. The boy couldn't believe what he was seeing. The oasis, rather than being just a well surrounded by a few palm trees, as he had seen once in a geography book, was much larger than many towns back in Spain. There were 300 wells, 50,000 date trees, and innumerable coloured tents spread among them. It looks like a thousand and one nights, said the Englishman, impatient to meet with the alchemist. They were relieved and happy. That first day, everyone slept from exhaustion, including the Englishman. The boy was assigned a place far from his friend in a tent with five other young men of about his age. They were people of the desert, and clamoured to hear his stories about the great cities. The boy told them about his life as a shepherd, and was about to tell them of his experiences at the crystal shop when the Englishman came into the tent. I've been looking for you all morning, he said, as he led the boy outside. I need you to help me to find out where the alchemist lives. First, they tried to find him on their own. We've wasted almost the entire day said the Englishman, sitting down with the boy near one of the wells. Maybe we'd better ask someone, the boy suggested. A young woman approached, who was not dressed in black. She had a vessel on her shoulder, and her head was covered by a veil, but her face was uncovered. The boy approached her to ask about the alchemist. At that moment, it seemed to him that time stood still and the soul of the world surged within him. When he looked into her dark eyes and saw that her lips were poised between a laugh and silence, he learned the most important part of the language that all the world spoke, the language that everyone on earth was capable of understanding in their heart. It was love. Maktoub, thought the boy. The boy stepped closer to the girl, and when she smiled, he did the same. 
What's your name? he asked. Fatima, the girl said, averting her eyes. The Englishman prodded him, and the boy asked her about the man who cured people's illnesses. That's the man who knows all the secrets of the world, she said. He communicates with the genies of the desert. The genies were the spirits of good and evil, and the girl pointed to the south, indicating that it was there the strange man lived. Then she filled her vessel with water and left. The Englishman vanished too, gone to find the alchemist. And the boy sat there by the well for a long time, remembering that one day in Tarifa, the Levanter had bought to him the perfume of that woman, and realizing that he had loved her before he even knew she existed. He knew that his love for her would enable him to discover every treasure in the world. The boy went to the well every day to meet with Fatima. He told her about his life as a shepherd, about the king, and about the crystal shop. They became friends, and except for the 15 minutes he spent with her, each day seemed that it would never pass. When he had been at the oasis for about a month, the leader of the caravan called a meeting of all the people traveling with him. We don't know when the war will end, so we can't continue our journey, he said. The battles may last for a long time, perhaps even years. There are powerful forces on both sides, and the war is important to both armies. It's not a battle of good against evil, it's a war between forces that are fighting for the balance of power. And when that type of battle begins, it lasts longer than others, because Allah is on both sides people went back to where they were living, and the boy went to meet with Fatima that afternoon. He told her about the morning's meeting. The day after we met, Fatima said, you told me that you loved me. Then, you taught me something of the universal language and the soul of the world. Because of that, I have become a part of you. The boy listened to the sound of her voice, 
and thought it to be more beautiful than the sound of the wind in the date palms. waiting for you here at this oasis for a long time. I have forgotten about my past, about my traditions, and the way in which men of the desert expect women to behave. Ever since I was a child, I have dreamed that the desert would bring me a wonderful present. has arrived, and it's you. The boy wanted to take her hand, but Fatima's hands held to the handles of her jug. You have told me about your dreams, about the old king and your treasure, and you've told me about omens. So now I fear nothing, because it was those omens that brought you to me. I am a part of your dream, a part of your personal legend, as you call it. That's why I want you to continue toward your goal. If you have to wait until the war is over, then wait. But if you have to go before then, go on in pursuit of your dream. Dunes are changed by the wind, but the desert never changes. That's the way it will be with our love for each other. Maktoub, she said, if I am really a part of your dream, you'll come back one day. So be left her that day, 
The boy went to look for the Englishman. He wanted to tell him about Fatima. He was surprised when he saw that the Englishman had built himself a furnace outside his tent. This is the first phase of the job, he said. I have to separate out the sulfur. Now, to do that successfully, I must have no fear of failure. It was my fear of failure that first kept me from attempting the masterwork. And the boy stayed on until the desert turned pink in the setting sun. He felt the urge to go out into the desert, to see if its silence held the answers to his questions. He listened to the wind and felt the stones beneath his feet. He sat on a stone and allowed himself to become hypnotized by the horizon. As he sat there thinking, he sensed movement above him. Looking up, he saw a pair of hawks flying high in the sky. He felt sleepy. In his heart, he wanted to remain awake, but he also wanted to sleep. I'm learning the language of the world. Suddenly, one of the hawks made a flashing dive through the sky, attacking the other. Heed the omens, the old king had said. The boy recalled what he had seen in the vision and sensed that it was actually going to occur. An army is coming, the boy said. I had a vision. The desert fills men's hearts with visions, the camel driver answered. But the boy told him about the hawks, that he had been watching their flight and had suddenly felt himself to have plunged to the soul of the world. Go and speak to the tribal chieftains, said the camel driver. Tell them about the armies that are approaching. The boy thought of Fatima, and he decided he would go to see the chiefs of the tribes. The boy approached the guard at the front of the huge white tent at the center of the oasis. I want to see the chieftains. I've brought omens from the desert. There were eight chieftains, but the boy could see immediately which one of them was the most important. An Arab dressed in white and gold, seated at the center of the semicircle. Who is this stranger who speaks of omens? asked one of the chieftains, eyeing the boy. It is I, the boy answered, and he told what he had seen. Everything we know was taught to us by the desert. The old man gave a signal, and everyone stood. The meeting was over. The hookers were extinguished and the guards stood at attention. The boy made ready to leave, but the old man spoke again. Tomorrow we are going to break the agreement that says no one at the oasis may carry arms. Throughout the entire day, we will be on the lookout for our enemies. When the sun sets, the men will once again surrender their arms to me. For every ten dead men among our enemies, you will receive a piece of gold. But arms cannot be drawn unless they also go into battle. Arms are as capricious as the desert, and if they are not used, the next time they might not function. If at least one of them hasn't been used by the end of the day tomorrow, one will be used on you.
Suddenly, he heard a thundering sound, and he was thrown to the ground by a wind such as he had never known. The area was swirling in dust, so intense that it hid the moon from view. Before him was an enormous white horse, rearing over him with a frightening scream. When the blinding dust had settled a bit, the boy trembled at what he saw. Astride the animal was a horseman dressed completely in black, with a falcon perched on his left shoulder. He wore a turban, and his entire face, except for his eyes, were covered with a black kerchief. The strange horseman drew an enormous curved sword from a scabbard mounted on his saddle. The steel of its blade glittered in the light of the moon. Who dares to read the meaning of the flight of the hawks, he demanded, so loudly that his words seemed to echo through the fifty thousand palm trees of al -Fayum. It is I who dared to do so, said the boy. It is I who dared to do so, he repeated. The horseman was completely immobile. Why did you read the flight of the birds? I read only what the birds wanted to tell me. They wanted to save the oasis. Tomorrow all of you will die, because there are more men at the oasis than you have. Who are you to change what Allah has willed? Be careful with your prognostications, said the stranger. What is a stranger doing in a strange land? I'm following my personal legend. It is not something you would understand. The stranger placed his sword in its scabbard, and the boy relaxed. I had to test your courage, the stranger said. Courage is the quality most essential to understanding the language of the world. You must not let up, even after having come so far, he continued. You must love the desert, but never trust it completely. Because the desert tests all men, it challenges every step and kills those who become distracted. What he said reminded the boy of the old king. If the warriors come here, and your head is still on your shoulders at sunset, come and find me, said the stranger. The same hand that had brandished the sword now held a whip. The horse reared again, raising a cloud of dust. Where do you live? shouted the boy as the horseman rode away. The hand with the whip pointed to the south. The boy had met the alchemist. Before the sun had reached its high point, 500 tribesmen appeared on the horizon. The mounted troops entered the oasis from the north. It appeared to be a peaceful expedition, but they all carried arms hidden in their robes. When they reached the white tent at the center of al -Fayum, they withdrew their scimitars and rifles.
of the oasis surrounded the horsemen from the desert, and within half an hour, all but one of the intruders were dead. The tribal chieftain called for the boy and presented him with 50 pieces of gold and asked the boy to become the counselor of the Oasis. When the sun had set and the first stars made their appearance, the boy started to walk to the south. He eventually sighted a single tent and a group of Arabs passing by told the boy that it was a place inhabited by genies. But the boy sat down and waited. Not until the moon was high did the alchemist ride into view. I'm going with you, the boy said, and he immediately felt peace in his heart. We'll leave tomorrow before sunrise, was the alchemist's only response. The boy spent a sleepless night. Two hours before dawn, he awoke one of the boys who slept in his tent and asked him to show him where Fatima lived. I'm going away, he said, and I want you to know that I'm coming back. I love you because don't say anything, Fatima interrupted. One is loved because one is loved. No reason is needed for loving. But the boy continued. I had a dream and I met with a king. I sold crystal and crossed the desert. And because the tribes declared war, I went to the well seeking the alchemist. So I love you because the entire universe conspired to help me find you. The two embraced. It was the first time either had touched the other. I'll be back. The boy said. Don't think about what you've left behind, the alchemist said to the boy as they began to ride across the sands of the desert. Everything is written in the soul of the world, and there it will stay forever.
the alchemist rode in front with the falcon on his shoulder. The bird knew the language of the desert well, and whenever they stopped, he flew off in search of game. told me nothing along the way, said the boy. I thought you were going to teach me some of the things you know. A while ago, I rode through the desert with a man who had books on alchemy, but I wasn't able to learn anything from them. There is only one way to learn, the alchemist answered. It's through action. Everything you need to know, you have learned through your journey. You need to learn only one thing more. alchemist? Because that's what I am. And what went wrong when other alchemists tried to make gold and were unable to do so? They were looking only for gold, his companion answered. They were seeking the treasure of their personal legend without wanting actually to live out the personal legend. What is it that I still need to know? The boy asked. But the alchemist continued to look to the horizon. And finally the falcon returned with their meal. They dug a hole and lit their fire in it so that the light of the flames would not be seen.
the alchemist began to draw in the sand and completed his drawing in less than five minutes. As he drew, the boy thought of the old king and the plaza where they had met that day. It seemed as if it had taken place years and years ago. This is what was written on the emerald tablet, said the alchemist when he had finished. The boy tried to read what was written in the sand. It's a code, said the boy, a bit disappointed. It looks like what I saw in the Englishman's books. No, the alchemist answered. It's like the flight of those two hawks. It can't be understood by reason alone. The emerald tablet is a direct passage to the soul of the world. Should I understand the emerald tablet, the boy asked? Perhaps. If you were in a laboratory of alchemy, this would be the right time to study the best way to understand the emerald tablet. But you are in the desert, so immerse yourself in it. The desert will give you an understanding of the world. In fact, anything on the face of the earth will do that. You don't even have to understand the desert. All you have to do is contemplate a simple grain of sand, and you will see in it all the marvels of creation. How do I immerse myself in the desert? Listen to your heart. It knows all things because it came from the soul of the world, and it will one day return there. They crossed the desert for another two days in silence. The alchemist had become much more cautious because they were approaching the area where the most violent battles were being waged. As they moved along, the boy tried to listen to his heart. The boy continued to listen to his heart as they crossed the desert. He came to understand its dodges and tricks, and to accept it as it was. That night, he told all of this to the alchemist. And the alchemist understood that the boy's heart had returned to the soul of the world. So what should I do now? the boy asked. Continue in the direction of the pyramids, said the alchemist, and continue to pay heed to the omens. Your heart is still capable of showing you where the treasure is. Is that the one thing I still need you to know? No, the alchemist answered.
is lost forever in the place of history it's never won in fact your soul is lost in the crush to long forgotten now and then again naturally we sing of nature as our own for being all of nature seen spell it out as angels living dangerously for all our sense of living out this tale of being naturally we sing of nature as our own Being all of nature seen Spell it out As angels living dangerously For all our sense of living out This tale of being All the sense of being What you still need to know is this Before a dream is realized The soul of the world tests everything that was learned along the way. It does this not because it is evil, but so that we can, in addition to realizing our dreams, master the lessons we've learned as we've moved toward that dream. That's the point at which most people give up. It's the point at which, as we say in the language of the desert, One dies of thirst just when the palm trees have appeared on the horizon. Every search begins with beginner's luck, and every search ends with the victors being severely tested. The boy remembered an old proverb from his country. It said that the darkest hour of the night came just before the dawn. They continued across the desert. With every day that passed, the boy's heart became more and more silent. It no longer wanted to know about things of the past or future. It was content simply to contemplate the desert and to drink with the boy from the soul of the world. And the boy and his heart had become friends. And neither was capable now of betraying the other. When his heart spoke to him, It was to provide a stimulus to the boy and to give him strength, because the days of silence there in the desert were wearisome. His heart told the boy what his strongest qualities were, his courage in having given up his sheep and in trying to live out his personal legend, and his enthusiasm during the time he had worked at the crystal shop. And his heart told him something else that the boy had never noticed. It told the boy of dangers that had threatened him, but that he had never perceived. When they had crossed the mountain range that extended along the entire horizon, the alchemist said that they were only two days from the pyramids. If we are going to go our separate ways soon, the boy said, then teach me about alchemy. You already know about alchemy. It is about penetrating to the soul of the world and discovering the treasure that has been reserved for you. Everything in the universe evolved he said. He reached over and picked up a shell from the ground. This desert was once a sea, he said. I noticed that, the boy answered. The sea has lived on in this shell because that's its personal legend. It will never cease doing so until the desert is once again covered by water. They mounted their horses and rode out in the direction of the pyramids of Egypt. The sun was setting when the boy's heart sounded a danger signal. They were surrounded by gigantic dunes and the boy looked at the alchemist to see whether he had sensed anything. But he appeared to be unaware of any danger. Five minutes later, the boy saw two horsemen waiting ahead of them. Before he could say anything to the alchemist, the two horsemen had become ten, and then a hundred. And then they were everywhere in the dunes. <laughs> Thank you.
were tribesmen dressed in blue, with black rings surrounding their turbans. Their faces were hidden behind blue veils, with only their eyes showing. Even from a distance, their eyes conveyed the strength of their souls, and their eyes spoke of death. The two were taken to a nearby military camp. These are the spies, said one of the men. We're just travelers, the alchemist answered. You were seen at the enemy camp three days ago, and you were talking with one of the troops there. Oh, I'm just a man who wanders the desert and knows the stars, said the alchemist. I have no information about troops or about the movement of the tribes. I was simply acting as a guide for my friend here. Who is your friend? the chief asked. An alchemist, said the alchemist. He understands the forces of nature, and he wants to show you his extraordinary powers. The boy listened quietly and fearfully. What's a foreigner doing here? asked another of the men. He has brought money to give to your tribe, said the alchemist before the boy could say a word. And seizing the boy's bag, the alchemist gave the gold coins to the chief. The Arab accepted them without a word. There was enough there to buy a lot of weapons. What is an alchemist? he asked finally. It's a man who understands nature and the world. If he wanted to, he could destroy this camp just with the force of the wind. The men laughed. They were used to the ravages of war and knew that the wind could not deliver them a fatal blow. Yet each felt his heart beat a bit faster. They were men of the desert, and they were fearful of sorcerers. I want to see him do it, said the chief. Oh, he needs three days, answered the alchemist. He's going to transform himself into the wind, just to demonstrate his powers. If he can't do it, we humbly offer you our lives for the honor of your tribe. You can't offer me something that's already mine, the chief said arrogantly. But he granted the travelers three days. The boy was shaking with fear, but the alchemist helped him out of the tent. Don't let them see you're afraid, the alchemist said. They are brave men, and they despise cowards. Don't give in to your fears, said the alchemist in a strangely gentle voice. If you do, you won't be able to talk to your heart. But I have no idea how to turn myself into the wind. If a person is living out his personal legend, he knows everything he needs to know. There is only one thing that makes a dream impossible to achieve, the fear of failure. I'm not afraid of failing, it's just I don't know how to turn myself into the wind. Well, you'll have to learn. Your life depends on it. But what if I can't? Then you'll die in the midst of trying to realize your personal legend. Well, that's a lot better than dying like millions of other people who never even knew what their personal legends were. The first day passed. There was a major battle nearby and a number of wounded were brought back to the camp. The dead soldiers were replaced by others, and life went on. Death doesn't change anything, the boy thought. The boy went looking for the alchemist, who had taken his falcon out into the desert. I still have no idea how to turn myself into the wind, the boy repeated. Remember what I told you. The world is only the visible aspect of God, and that what alchemy does is to bring spiritual perfection into contact with the material plane. What are you doing? Feeding my falcon. 
If I'm not able to turn myself into the wind, we're going to die, the boy said. Why feed your falcon? You're the one who may die, the alchemist said. I already know how to turn myself into the wind. On the second day, the boy climbed to the top of a cliff near the camp. The sentinels allowed him to go. They had already heard about the sorcerer who could turn himself into the wind, and they didn't want to go near him. In any case, the desert was impassable. He spent the entire afternoon of the second day looking out over the desert and listening to his heart. The boy knew the desert sensed his fear. They both spoke the same language. On the third day, the chief met with his officers. He called the alchemist to the meeting and said, Let's go and see the boy who turns himself into the wind. Let's, the alchemist answered. The boy took them to the cliff where he had been on the previous day. He told them all to be seated. It's going to take a while, the boy said. We're in no hurry, the chief answered. We are men of the desert. out at the horizon. There were mountains in the distance, and there were dunes, rocks, and plants that insisted on living where survival seemed impossible. There was the desert that he had wandered for so many months. Despite all that time, he knew only a small part of it. Within that small part, he had found an Englishman, caravans, tribal wars, and an oasis with 50,000 palm trees and 300 wells. What do you want here today? the desert asked him. Didn't you spend enough time looking at me yesterday? The 
breeze began to blow. The tribesmen watched the boy from a distance, talking among themselves in a language that the boy couldn't understand. The alchemist smiled.
The simum blew that day as it had never blown before. For generations thereafter, the Arabs recounted the legend of a boy who had turned himself into the wind, almost destroying a military camp in defiance of the most powerful chief in the desert. The following day, the general bade the boy and the alchemist farewell and provided them with an escort party to accompany them as far as they chose. They rode for the entire day. Toward the end of the afternoon, they came upon a Coptic monastery. The alchemist dismounted and told the escorts they could return to the camp. From here on, you will be alone, the alchemist said. You are only three hours from the pyramids. Thank you, said the boy. You taught me the language of the world. I only invoked what you already knew. No matter what he does, every person on earth plays a central role in the history of the world. And normally, he doesn't know it. The boy smiled. He had never imagined that questions about life would be of such importance to a shepherd. Goodbye, the alchemist said. Goodbye, said the boy. The boy rode along through the desert for several hours, listening avidly to what his heart had to say. It was his heart that would tell him where his treasure was hidden. Where your treasure is, there also will be your heart, the alchemist had told him. As he was about to climb yet another dune, his heart whispered, Be aware of the place where you are brought to tears. That's where I am, and that's where your treasure is. The boy climbed the dune slowly. A full moon rose again in the starry sky. It had been a month since he had set forth from the oasis. The moonlight cast shadows through the dunes, creating the appearance of a rolling sea. It reminded the boy of the day that the horse had reared in the desert, and he had come to know the alchemist. When he reached the top of the dune, his heart leapt. There, illuminated by the light of the moon and the brightness of the desert, stood the solemn and majestic Pyramids of Egypt. The boy looked at the sands around him and saw that where his tears had fallen, a scarab beetle was scuttling through the sand. Another omen. Throughout the night, the boy dug at the place he had chosen, but found nothing. He felt weighted down by the centuries of time since the pyramids had been built, but he didn't stop. As he was attempting to pull out the rocks he encountered, he heard footsteps. Several figures approached him. Their backs were to the moonlight, and the boy could see neither their eyes nor their faces. What are you doing here? One of the figures demanded. Because he was terrified, the boy didn't answer. He had found where his treasure was and was frightened of what might happen. We're refugees from the tribal wars and we need money, the other figure said. What are you hiding there? I'm not hiding anything, the boy answered. There's gold here, he said. The moon shone on the face of the Arab who had seized him, and in the man's eyes the boy saw death. I'm digging for treasure! And although his mouth was bleeding and swollen, he told his attackers that he had twice dreamed of a treasure hidden near the pyramids of Egypt. Leave him. He doesn't have anything else. He must have stolen this gold. We're leaving. 
You're not gonna die, you'll live. And you'll learn that a man shouldn't be so stupid. Two years ago, right here on this spot, I had a recurrent dream too. I dreamed that I should travel to the fields of Spain and look for a ruined church where shepherds and their sheep slept. In my dream, there was a sycamore growing out of the ruins of the sacristy, and I was told that if I dug at the roots of the sycamore, I would find a hidden treasure. I'm not so stupid as to cross an entire desert just because of a recurrent dream. And they disappeared. The boy stood up shakily and looked once more at the pyramids. They seemed to laugh at him, and he laughed back, his heart bursting with joy, because now he knew where his treasure was. The boy reached the small abandoned church just as night was falling. The sycamore was still there in the sacristy, and the stars could still be seen through the half-destroyed roof. Now he was here not with his flock, but with a shovel. He began to dig at the base of the sycamore. An hour later, he had before him a chest of Spanish gold coins. There were also precious stones, gold masks adorned with red and white feathers, and stone statues embedded with jewels. He placed Urim and Thummim in the chest. The wind began to blow again. It was the Levanter. It didn't bring with it the smell of the desert, nor the threat of Moorish invasion. Instead, it brought the scent of a perfume he knew well. The boy smiled. It was the first time she had done that. I'm coming, Fatima, he said. Mm -hmm.